I've been a pretty big fan of Genesis recently. I've been checking out all their albums, listening to all their music, and while I don't like all of it, the albums I do like, I like a lot. And I like the band, I think they're interesting, I think they have a lot of history, so I was like, you know what, I need to do another video. Why not do it about Genesis? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a three-part series talking about the rise, uh, you know, the very top of their career, you know, the high of their career, and the fall. Hope you're here to join me for all three parts and hope you enjoy. Let's get into the video. We're waiting for you. Come and join us now. We need you with us. Come and join us now. In 1965, Jarhouse School, two students, Anthony Phillips and Mike Rutherford, would create a band called Annie or The Annie. In 1967, they would join with another band called The Garden Wall. The two members of The Garden Wall were Peter Gabriel and Tony Banks. Soon after, Chris Stort would join the band too, as drummer. This would solidify the first lineup of the band. Mike Rutherford on bass, Tony Banks on keyboards, Anthony Phillips on guitar, Peter Gabriel on vocals, and Chris Stort on drums. Later that year, in 1967, the band would record a demo and would get recognized by a former Charhouse student, John King. King, impressed with the band, wanted to help them out. The only thing was, they did not have a new name. Jonathan King thought of the name Gabriel's Angels, but soon enough, that uh, name was discarded, thrown out the window. The band did not like it, so John King had to think of a different name. Soon after, he thought of From Genesis to Revelation. The band agreed. Although in the Peter Gabriel biography, uh, Without Frontiers, Mike Rutherford thought that the name wasn't really that great, but it was better than Gabriel's Angels. Now being found, and soon enough to be signed, the band would drop out of school in late 67. Except for Chris Stort. His parents would not let him, so he actually had to leave the band. Shortly after, though, would be replaced by John Silver. And by 1968... John King would get a contract deal with Decca Records. Decca Records, at the time, was known for jazz and blues albums of the 1930s and 40s, and also for turning down the Beatles. King would produce the first album with the band in August of 1968. Their self-titled album would release in 1969 of March. The album was a mixture of pop, folk, and psychedelic rock of the 60s. Upon the album's initial release, though, it was not uh, labeled that way as a rock album or a pop album, but Record Stores instead would label it as a religious album because there's no other text besides the title from Genesis to Revelation. With that, the album would only sell 650 copies upon its initial release. With that, the album did fail, with even the singles preceding it also failing Silent Sun and A Winter's Tale which obviously deeply disappointed the band and the record label and John King. Even to this day, if you ask most Genesis fans, they would most likely put it at the bottom of their list or very close to the bottom of their list of Genesis albums just because it's not really that memorable. But it's not a bad album. It's just not that memorable. But there are some great songs, such as the opening track, Where Sour Turns Sweet, In the Beginning, the Psychedelic Rock Fuse song, The Serpent, which is probably my favorite out of the whole album, and the Neil Diamond has song, In the Wilderness, which leads into the next song, The Conqueror, which is also pretty good. Despite that, though, months later, after the album was released in 1969, John Silver would also leave the band, but soon enough replaced with John Mayhew. Despite that, though, John Keane and Decca Records, disappointed with the band and the album, would leave the band after the contract expired in late 1969, leaving the band to fend for themselves. Looking for someone I guess I'm doing that Trying to find a memory in a dark Through the rest of 1969, the group would play small gigs and write new material. Since the band were unsigned, they would play a gig at the Brunel University in London as a supporting act on November 1st, 1969, since labels and promoters would most of the time be at those types of concerts. 
This would be their second live show, though, their first being a birthday party on October 26, 1969. The group got paid £25. They didn't get found by a new record label, but through the time playing, more gigs, the band would ditch the softer acoustic sound and go for a louder, more electric sound. After a year of playing with the gigs, in April of 1970, they would finally get found by Tony Stratton Smith and would get signed to his label, Charisma Records. By that time, their name was also shortened by what everyone knows him by, Genesis. In the following months, Genesis would go on to record one of the most transitional albums ever, Trespass. It would be a dive into a new style of music at the time called Progressive Rock. Other bands like that at the time were Pink Floyd, ELP, King Crimson, and many others. Right after Genesis finished recording the new album, drummer John Mayhew, the Estic, left the band. Not only that, though, a bigger loss was that Anthony Phillips left the band too, their guitarist and main songwriter. The reason being that he got bronchial pneumonia and was advised by his doctor to leave the group. So once again, the band held an audition to find a new drummer. Through many uh, failed uh, drummers auditioning for the group, they found a young Phil Collins with hair. Unlike all the past drummers, Phil Collins would stay in the band for years to come. Still, though, they did not have another guitarist. Besides that, though, on October 23, 1970, Trespass would be released and featured cover art by Paul Whitehead, which would go on to do future Genesis albums. It would sell 6,000 copies on its initial release date, and while it wasn't a commercial success, gained mixed reviews from critics, it did show that there was more people listening to the band, there was more fans, and even reached number one in Belgium, so they could tour overseas, and that helped them gain even more fans. It sold 6,000 copies on its initial release date. While it still wasn't commercially successful, gained mixed reviews by critics, it did show that there was more fans, more people listening, and even reached number one in Belgium, so they could tour overseas. The album showed longer and more complex music compositions. Noble songs would be Looking for Someone, Visions of Angels, Stagnation for that eerie keyboard solo, and the song that overshadows the rest of the album most of the time, the heavy tune, The Knife. This would be a live favorite for audiences and be played for years to come. It would also be released as a single in January of 1971. They were getting some success, they had more fans, they were playing live more. The only thing was, they needed a new guitarist. And by the end of 1970, they would. They would find a young guitarist by the name of Steve Hackett through an ad in the paper. His unique style of playing and similar music taste was perfect for the band. But at first, Steve was a little hesitant to join because he thought he wasn't good enough for the band. But the band thought the complete opposite. He soon enough joined after talking to the members and negotiating, I guess you could say. This is the original lineup that people would call the Pierre Gabriel era, where they would release some of their most experimental and progressive rock-oriented albums. Now the band being complete, they would go off and tour and record their next album. The album would be released on November 12th, 1971, and would be their third studio album and would peak at number 39 in the UK charts, and gained a silver certificate in 2013 by the British Phonographic Industry. This album would be the first to have Phil Collins and Steve Hackett, and by this point, make Genesis a full-on prog group. The album would show Steve Hackett's amazing guitar techniques, most prominently his early version of tapping on the guitar, shown most prominently in the beginning of the song, Return of the Giant Hogweed. Not only that, though, it showed the musical talents of all the members, respectively. Tony Banks with his dynamic use of the mellotron and organ, Mike Rutherford with his multitasking of playing bass and rhythm guitar, Phil Collins with his intricate drumming and backing vocals, and just as importantly, Peter Gibble's weird yet interesting storytelling, making the lyrics and the music just that much more important during the development. Some of my favorite tracks being The Fallon of Salamisus, I think that's how you say that, Return of the Giant Hogweed, and most importantly, the song that shows off the talents of all the members, 
the musical box. This track was important in showing how all five members can help and make a masterpiece. The period was weird lyrics of a boy getting decapitated by his friend while playing croquet. Forgot to mention that they're very English at this time and having his soul trapped in a musical box where he grows old and becomes sex deprived and perverted with his childhood friend. Anyway, the mellow opening with the trio of acoustic guitars being played by Steve Hackett, Mike Rutherford, and a tall string by Tony Banks with Peter Gabriel singing a nice flute solo just works so well into the song as it builds up the line. Play me my song. Here it goes again. Flowing so well until an electric guitar comes in. And then the organ. Then the drums. When Steve had his first solo just comes in, ripping through the music. Until everything just starts to settle and settle. And you hear Peter Gabriel's voice coming in again as the old man speaking into his childhood friend. Brush back your hair and let me get to know your face. I've been waiting here for so long. Second solo comes in and goes into the greatest finale. In October of 1972, they would release Foxtrot, but not just that, a single called Happy the Man would also release the same month. Did not chart, but is considered a hidden jam with some fans. Foxtrot on the hand would go on to sell 590,000 copies, certified gold, and hit number 12 in the UK charts, showing how the band was growing a small but devoted fan base. This would be the last album that Whitehead did for the band, since the final product the band just didn't like. For the most part being that it didn't relate to the source material. Major tracks off this album for me would be Watcher of the Skies for that Mellotron organ intro, Game Out by Friday, Can Utility and the Coastliners, the beautiful Bach-inspired solo acoustic track Horizons, which leads into their longest song ever recorded, Supper's Right. Ranking in at over 23 minutes long, Supper's Ready is considered by fans, including me, to be one of their best tracks ever, if not their best. Piecing together smaller songs by the band into a grand, cohesive piece of storytelling and progressive rock. Noble parts are Steve Hackett's otherworldly guitar fills and tapping, 
Tony Banks' organ skills that complement Hackett's playing the more darker parts such as Apocalypse and 9-8. Not only that though, it shows Phil Collins' great odd time signature drumming abilities, and most important of all, Peter Gabriel's humor, storytelling, and characters throughout the song. Besides the more success they were getting with every up and coming album, the band would take a more creative look on live shows, all because of a technical problem with the PA. More specifically, Gabriel would take his characters from his songs, and not just sing them to the audience, but show them. On September 28, 1972, during a show at the National Stadium in Dublin, while touring for Foxtrot during the finale of Musical Box, Peter Gabriel came out with a fox head and wore his wife's red dress, which would be the first time Peter Gabriel would wear a costume to expand the ideas in his music. No surprise though, this did shock audiences. But what I feel is more shocking is Peter Gabriel's uh, new haircut, which that's a uh, it definitely looks stupid. <laughs> In 1973, the cult status band come up with the biggest album ever in the Gable era. And not only that though, they would get their first big hit. The album being Some England by The Pound. The album art this time would be done by Betty Swanwick. The album reached number 3 in the UK charts. Not only that though, but it was the first album to hit the US charts, reaching at number 70. Even sold the most copies in the U.S. supposedly with 500,000 copies. The first big hit was "I Know What I Like," parentheses in your wardrobe. It only charted at number 53 in the U.K. In 45 in Belgium, but it showed that even in the proud years, Genesis weren't shy of popping in music. Top tracks for me are the opener. Dancing with the Moonlit Night, the prog classic Firth of Fifths, the single I Know What I Like, the Monty Python-esque Bell of Epping Forest, and the Cinema Show. Another thing that this album showed was connecting certain tracks and having similar music motifs, primarily in their first and last track, something that they would take further in their next album. Said old Tessa out loud. Easy love, there's the safe way home. Thankful for her fine fair discount. Tess cooperates. Still alone in all oh, hello. See the deadly nightshade glow. While on a tour for this, Peter Gabriel would take the, the actress 
the next level with more costumes and stories in between songs. While many of them were uh, weird and goofy, a flower. You go down to win the wall to look for butterflies, butterflies, butterflies. Open your eyes. It would make chances stick out from the other rock groups and help gain a bigger audience. All of these ideas though will be stretched to their limit. In their next album, The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. And the In 1974, Genesis would record their sixth studio album. This would be the band's most ambitious album ever, being that it is a double LP concept album. The concept being a rock opera about a Puerto Rican kid living in New York and his journey throughout the sewers of the city. And it's also a journey to the soul story at the same time. At least, that's what Peter Gabriel said. The story was mainly conceived by Peter Gabriel after he saw the acid western El Topo, which is definitely a... Uh, strange film to say the least. The band would go to record the album in a barn called The Mobile Studio in Newcastle, Wells from August to October of 1972. Not only that this would be the most ambitious album, it would also be the most difficult album to make because of the feuding between Pierre Gabriel and the rest of the band. While Pierre Gabriel was working on the album, he was also collaborating with William Friedkin, the director of Exorcist come up with new ideas and concepts for his next film. Not just that though, the main thing that made it hard to record the album and be able to stay on good terms with the band was whenever there was a complication with the birth of Peter Gabriel's first child. Even though his daughter did survive the birth, Peter Gabriel's child was still ill and Peter would have to go back and forth from home to studio and that caused a rift in the band since the rest of the band weren't as supportive as Gabriel wished they were at the time. Either way, with this sad news and complicated term of events, the album would be finished and it released in November 18th, 1974. The album charted at number 10 in the UK before it won in the US. This time, the album cover would be done by Hypnosis, the same people that did covers for Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. Even though this album should be listened to all the way through, top tracks for me are the title track. The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, Back in the NYC, Hairless Heart, Counting Up Time, just for the goofy and unique sounding solo, The Carpet Crawlers, which I think is a timeless Genesis song and a, a classic that sticks out from the album, The Waiting Room, and The Colony of Slipperman, and many others, but these are at least the ones I can think of off the top of my head. While the album explored new ideas and soundscapes, the band had to take those ideas and show them live. The band would not only tour in the UK, but also in America, before the album was even released in America. Just like past concerts, Peter Gabriel would wear different costumes to show the characters and ideas. Besides Rel, the main costume that was remembered the most was the Slipper Man, which is definitely my favorite costume, looking like a tumorous character coming straight out of John Carpenter's theme, with the face and what looks like to be a hand flipping the bird. Despite the fact other members of the band weren't as happy with the costumes, saying that it was impossible for Peter Gabriel to sing and it distracted from the music and he would always break something or mess up something or something would just go wrong whenever he would put on one of these extravagant costumes. Besides just the costumes, some of the band wasn't even that happy with the story. Tony Banks specifically saying that he wasn't really that interested in the story and thought it was the weakest part of the album. And before you can think you can watch the whole concert and dictate for yourself about the costumes and everything, uh, there were professional cameramen, but they were never able to film. Mostly because Peter Gabriel let the cameras turn on whenever he was ready. Sadly, he was never ready. But at least there are some bootlegs of some of the concert, so we can at least see that. While the group finished touring in the UK, they did not finish the last few shows of the US tour because by this time they were overworked, losing money, and were just sick of each other and playing live in general. Not just that though, delusion by the band, wanting to spend more time with his family, Peter Gabriel would leave Genesis in 1975, 
never to tour with them ever again. They're moving in time to a heavy wooden door Where the needle's eye is winking, closing on the poor The carpet 